Good morning, everyone. Hope you're all having a fantastic day. Hope your weekend went amazingly well. Let's see. This looks a little funky. Okay, good, good, good. Tonight, we're gonna be doing an Ask Me Anything on Reddit. Typically not a fan of Ask Me Anythings because um, oftentimes the people ask silly questions. That said, I decided to do it. And um, so far, a lot of people have submitted very good questions. So I'm very excited about that. Um, maybe that's because normally I, I mainly do um, very educational content. So people want to see me having more fun or something like that, which I certainly understand. And I'm all for having fun. That said, time is valuable. No fun here. What's the subreddit? The poker subreddit. I don't exactly know the link. Um, I will post something about it on Twitter. It uh, Actually, maybe I can find it. Um, Reddit.com slash r slash poker. That's the URL. So that'll be tonight from 8 p.m. till 10 p.m. Eastern time. That said, you can submit your questions now. And if they're good, I'll answer them. I, I don't spend a ton of time on internet forums anymore, and apparently Reddit is neat, and that people upvote things, and uh, that makes people see the good, useful things. And all the garbage goes to the bottom. If you all know me, um, I tend to answer every question. If you've ever been to any, one, any of my webinars, we, uh, we get through them all, because I understand if someone is willing to sit there and type out a real question, I'm more than happy to answer it. That said... Um, they posted that I'm doing a webinar, or I'm, I'm doing the uh, Ask Me Anything a few hours ago, and there's already a whole lot of questions, so we'll see how it goes. PLO8 for rolls. No, absolutely not. That would be silly. It's absolutely silly to play for all of your money. Unless, of course, you don't care about money. Dan took part of our New Year deal. Very nice. I'm glad to hear that. So did Lewis. Fantastic. You just completed your first homework. It was challenging. Yeah. The homework are, homeworks are supposed to be challenging. I mean, they take me an hour or so to make it. I'm pretty fast at it. I imagine they take most of the students three or four hours. And you now that's a lot of work. It's not for everyone. Most people aren't looking to spend that much time on poker. But it is useful. What's the best book on short stacked poker? I don't know. I discuss it in all of my books. Um, Secrets of Professional Tournament Poker Volume 1 discusses it pretty accurately. And um, I think that's a good place to start. So... Louis Philippe says he free rolled his three year poker coaching subscription with a two and a half hour session at one two. Yeah, you, you all go study for me, play one two for two and a half hours, make $300, and there you go. You're set for three years. Easy game. I'm happy Louis Philippe's crushing it. That makes me, makes me happy to hear because I know he works hard and studies. So I had one question from the Ask Me Anything that was already sent in. And um, I wanted to discuss it. I think Lewis is saying that he went through my most recent, or the most recent homework challenge. I actually have not gone through those yet. You want a main event seat through a contest? <laughs> it's above your usual buy-in. Any advice to stay calm? Play a lot, study a lot, get good at poker, and realize it's no different than anything else. All right. Here's a question from Reddit. I was going to try to type out an answer to this, but then I got to thinking that this would be a pretty good topic for a little coffee anyway. So instead of typing out a 20 page answer, I'm going to talk about it with you all. So here's the question. Let me just read it exactly. What stakes were you playing when you first realized you were a good player? I don't just mean ego. I mean actually having a sensible win rate and was able to have some decent game theory going. Second question. How long was I a bad reg before I got there? Interesting question. I, I think there's a lot of mindset issues going on with this. So first things first, what stakes was I playing when I realized I was good at poker? Um, quite high. And even then, I don't even view myself as good at poker. Um, there's a spectrum of skill levels, right? You can either be just like god awful, you can be pretty good, you can be decently good, you can be very good, you can be the best in the world. I know I'm not the best in the world. And in my mind, to be quote unquote good essentially means I am the best in the world, and I'm not. I realize this, right? Um, so when I'm like, when did I realize I could make money from poker? I realized that almost immediately. How did that happen though? You have to understand, before I ever played for real money, more than $1 buy in, I did play $1 buy in before I knew what I was doing. Before I played for more than a $1 buy-in, 
I read about 20 poker books. This was back before um, there were training sites. They didn't exist yet. But I bought literally every poker book on the market. I was working a $10 an hour job. I spent, I guess, $600 or so on books. It's a decent investment, right? But that's because I know that whenever I approach anything, I want to study from people who are better than me. Smart to study from people who are better than you who have already done it. Now, in poker, anybody can write a book, so you don't actually have to have done it. But I learned some good things and learned some bad things. And fortunately, I was able to figure out what was good and what was bad, right? So I bought about $600 worth of poker books, studied all of them. Then I made a $50 deposit on Party Poker. And um, most of what I read was on Limit Hold'em, because Limit Hold'em was the main game back then. Uh, this was in 2003. This was before No Limit sort of blew up. So, what happened? What did we do? Well, I grinded it up. I, I started with $50. I played 25 cent, 50 cent. I only had 100 bets then. I was going to be willing to put in a little bit more money, but I never had to. I had 100 bets. Then I always made a point to try to keep 300 bets in my account at a time because that's what I read um, what was what was required. You actually need more bets than that at Limit Hold'em. But that's it. So, I started small and was winning. I never thought I was good, though. I presumed I was just playing better than my opponents, which I understood back then did not take much skill because back then nobody was reading even poker books. They were just gambling, right? So I never really thought I was good. And the second line of this, I think, is very, very relevant. I don't mean just ego. I have never really had much of an ego. Why is that? I think I've always been lucky in that... I was always pretty good at most things I wanted to do, like not basketball, I was very bad at basketball, <laughs> but um, I played chess as a kid, I played Magic the Gathering as a kid, and I played a trumpet as a kid. Three things. These three things I think were very influential to me because at chess, I was not the best kid in my school. I was close to the top, I had a rival, a guy named Prabhu, one of my friends, and um, he, yeah, we were probably roughly equal, I mean I'm sure one of us had an edge. I think it was maybe me, but it doesn't matter, right? I was reading chess books by grandmasters. Obviously, they're better than me. I'm certainly not good, because those people are good. Um, Magic the Gathering. I had a guy, uh, Brandon, who was always a little bit better than me. I was the second best person in my city, but I was not the best. Brandon beat me way more than I beat him. That's definitively true. And even then, I realized Brandon would go off to tournaments and have like a, a break-even record, which means he's not even that good, right? So... There's always people better than you. And this idea that I have to prove that I am good or I have to like demonstrate and uh, please my ego, I think is silly. You don't need your ego to be pleased. You have to get rid of your ego. Your ego is your enemy and it will destroy you if you let it. Um, trumpet, same thing. I, I was always the best kid in my school. I was the best kid in the county. When I, turned, when I got to 10th grade, so 10th, 11th, 12th grade, I was the best player in the county among all trumpet players, but I also played in an orchestra at church, and I was awful compared to the players there. Like, literally awful. There were, like, three other trumpet players. One guy was the um, best player in the symphony in my hometown. Another guy was the second best player in the symphony in the hometown. And the other guy, a guy named Bob, was just a random dude who played sometimes, and he was amazing, too. <laughs> and all these people were better by a mile than me, the best kid in the whole county. So I realized I'm not very good, right? And tough, I mean, it, 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 again, you always have to ask, who am I comparing myself to, right? I always compared myself to people who were better than me. That didn't make me depressed, right? I wasn't depressed that random Bob, who played only on Sundays, was like a great player, right? That didn't bother me. That just made me aspire to be better. And so I think it's a mindset of not, not getting frustrated or envious of other people in there, what they're doing, but being inspired by what they're doing. And so, yes, I realized I was better than a bunch of kids at school, but I was also way worse than actual people who are decent. And to be fair, uh, the guy who was the number one player in the symphony would not even be able to make, like, a, you know, big city symphony. He'd be terrible. So <laughs> it's all relative. And you have to understand that skill levels are all very relative. So in poker, I never assumed I was that good. I mean, I know even when I uh, moved away from Limit Hold'em, I moved away from Limit Hold'em because 3060 was the highest stakes back then. And... They only had four tables now, so it was hard to get in a game, and I thought I could make more money playing sit-and-goes. I at least wanted to try it. So I started playing the high-stakes sit-and-goes. But even then, I realized I was not the best player in the game. So they had some world-class players there. I mean, when there was Andrew Robel, he's probably like probably the best, if not one of the best, in terms of hourly rates in the whole world. 
Um, we have Dave Benefield, who got rich and quit. We had um, Shannon Shore, world-class player, right? Lots and lots of world-class players played these games. And, you know, to be fair, I was competing with them, and I don't think I was the biggest winner, but I was definitely one of the biggest winners. Um, but even then, I didn't have an ego problem. I was always just trying to aspire and be better. And I think that's the mindset you have to have. You can't have the mindset of, I have to prove myself to someone. You need to get rid of that. Um, also, you say, when did I have a sensible win rate? Right off the bat, oh, I, would not, I mean, I moved up from 25 cent, 50 cent limit to 15.30 in, I don't know, a year, give or take, of like relatively part-time play. I mean, I always tried to play a lot. I spent all my free time doing it, but I, I was a winner right off the bat, and that's just because nobody else was very good. Um, but I never thought I was that good either. Like, that, that doesn't even go into my mind. Like, I don't think, ooh, I'm a good poker player now, so I should do blank or whatever, right? I, I never really thought that. Um, when was I able to have some decent game theory going? I, I'm still not even good at game theory now. I'm definitely not good at game theory. I read, um, there's a guy, Sam Gansfried, one of my friends. He um, studied theoretical math with my wife at, uh, at Harvard. <laughs> so, you know, clearly they, uh, she's a very, very smart guy. And this guy knows his game theory. And I bet if you ask him, he may even say that uh, there's more to it than he knows. I mean, game theory is absurdly difficult. And I'm certainly not a genius. I know poker game theory to some extent. But even then, like, he's talking about making heads up bots and whatnot. And um, that's, that's smart stuff. I'm not that smart. And I understand I'm not that smart. Maybe that's something else. I always knew I wasn't that smart, right? I am only good because I study a lot and work hard. I'm not naturally gifted at poker. When I started at poker, I was awful. I was losing to a random guy named Jake who, he was a homeless guy, and he would just go there and play us for $1 at poker. He'd win most of the time because we were terrible. And then he'd have 10 bucks for the week. He'd be thrilled, right? And I mean, I was working a $10 an hour job, so I'd go take him home and, well, take him home to the, he lived in the, lived in a car. And um, I would buy him ramen noodles. I, I always liked Jake. I learned a lot from Jake. Um, so anyway, what, where'd we get on? How'd we get on Jake? I don't know how we got on Jake. Anyway, I realized I was not that good, and I was happy to work towards it, because poker is a great game in that all you have to do is just work hard, and you'll be pretty good. If you have good work ethic and good discipline, you'll get good at it. And fortunately, I always had those things. I don't know why. Maybe that's because I wasn't naturally good at anything. If I am good at anything, it is working hard and learning. It's playing Limit Hold'em, the less variance route. Um, I don't know. Probably not today. It's hard to beat Limit Hold'em because Limit Hold'em is essentially solved. Limit Hold'em is not a hard game. It's one of the easier games. Um, so, yeah. J uh, Jake looked like Gimli from Lord of the Rings. Imagine imagine that. A short guy with a, a giant red beard. And he was mean. He probably robbed me a time or two. I don't even know. <laughs> but uh, I learned a lot from Jake. I learned I did not want to live, live in the junkyard. I knew that much. All right. Um... What's my favorite poker book? Grips. Evan Jarvis, hello. This is not an Ask Me Anything. That's tonight on Reddit. We're doing an Ask Me Anything at 8 p.m. till 10 p.m. tonight. What's my favorite poker book, though? Oh, that's an easy one. I like Life's a Gamble. This is a fun book. It's not, not necessarily an educational book, but this is a fun book full of gambling stories. Another question that's already came in on Reddit was, um, if I had to pick a dream lineup for a poker game, who would I, who would I put in it? And it's like all legends, like Mike Sexton. So anyway, it's my favorite educational. It's, it's, not, it's not that it, you learn, you learn from stories, right? Once you're really good at the actual strategy, you have to make sure you don't butcher your life. <laughs> and unfortunately, I've had some time to work with Mike Sexton and a few other of the legends in the game, and I've tried to share that with you. There's a video on YouTube. Um, only watch once you've won a million dollars or something like that. And I learned a lot from, from Mike Sexton, learning not to, not to lose all your money. All right, let's see. Okay, what else? Okay, so that's the mindset of game theory. Like, I, I know I'm not good at game theory now. I mean, I'm pretty good. But, like, I wor I'm working on a book now called Modern Poker Theory with Michael Acevedo. And he's good at game theory. He's, like, the go-to guy for the solvers. He helped develop the solvers. And he's a world-class poker player who plays online all the time. Doesn't even need to get up and go play live so much. He just plays online. And all, like, like uh, backing companies pay him tons of money to teach their students because... He knows, he knows it, right? 
I'm not good like he's good. And I, I understand this. All right, next. How long was I a bad reg before I got there? What does a bad reg mean? I mean, it's like an asinine term. What is a bad reg? A lot of people like throwing terms around that don't really mean anything. I'm going to presume, though, a bad reg is someone who wins at a tiny win rate. I don't know. I never won at only a tiny win rate. I mean, maybe I have devolved into a bad reg now because no one has big win rates. I mean, that could be a true statement. But um, I was always pretty good at sit and goes. I was always one of the biggest winners there. Obviously, I was good at limit hold'em. Um, in tournaments, I lost in tournaments for the first year I played. I had about $350,000 to my name from sit and goes, grinding it over three years straight. And then I transitioned to live tournaments when I turned 21. I had um, chopped the Sunday million, so I you know, thought I was decent at tournaments. But I went to live tournaments and got crushed. I lost about 200K over the first year. And I was wondering why this is. And it was not variance. I was not very good. So I was, that, that's not a bad reg. Maybe it is a bad reg. I wasn't regular. I was playing all the tournaments. But I, maybe I was bad. So yeah, I guess a year. It took me a year to go from being bad at tournaments and losing to good at tournaments and winning. So what happened? I started talking a lot with Dave Benefield. He helped me a ton. Tom Dwan helped me a ton. And I learned a lot from them. I learned just how to think outside the box and not just be a weak, tight knit. Um, so yeah. Forty says he likes my beard. This is just me not shaving for two days. All right, um, let's see. What's a good ROI? Depends on your games. Yeah, if you have questions about bankroll, go to jonathanlittlepoker.com slash bankroll. All right, let's see. I think that's it for that question. Um, like, I realized today, I'm not trying to play the super high-stakes games, right? I will play soft high-stakes games, Another question on Reddit was, um, what's the highest stakes you've ever played? And I'll answer it for you. It's 200, 400 live. And they said, who was the lineup? The lineup was me, Andrew Robel, a guy named Pat, who was very good, and then two recreational players who were not very good at all. I ended up winning 80K in about two hours. Um, and the other two pros won too. <laughs> so why is that the biggest game I've played? Why haven't I played bigger? And why is the lineup not stronger? Well, that's because to make money in cash games or in tournaments, you want to play in soft events and soft, soft cash games, right? My goal is not to stroke my ego. This, this is all from, um, I, I think a lot of people are really concerned with like, what is the most extravagant or difficult thing you've done? But the money is not won doing the extravagant and the difficult things. The money is won day-to-day -day grinding. And, I mean, that was when I was sitting there playing 1020. I was playing 1020. Andrew Robel and Pat were about to start a 200-400 game with these two guys. I'm like, we can do this. <laughs> so we got in there. But I haven't played a ton of that because usually when high stakes games run, they're either very private or they're very tough. And I'm not going to sit there and play in a very tough game. All right. How many times should you cash in 100 tournaments and how many wins? Well, Andrew, that depends on how many players are in the field, right? It depends on what percentage of the field gets paid. It's not as simple of a question as, um, as what you're asking. Why are all these people spamming my chat? If you're spamming my chat, realize you are bad at life. All right, let's see. Let's say you're running so bad, you feel like you can't win. Do you take a break through it? Is there a way for me to block the troll? Can I do that here? I don't think I can do that on my end. Do I have to go to youtube.com? I'm actually not on YouTube, interestingly enough. Um, how do I do this? I go to my channel? Is that what I'm supposed to do? Oh, let's see. I'll click this. I'll pause this. Where is the chat? How do I see the chat? Um, let's see. Click there. Hide user. I think I did it. Wow, look at all the messages deleted. All right, here's, an, here's another one. Hide user. Oh, these people wasting their lives. If you are, um, oh, you all can block from here. So yes, no mods can ban John. Okay, well let's uh, get some hide user. Don't make, don't make the fish the uh, the moderators. All right, let's see. Jarvi, you're going to be a mod now. Okay. Peter, you're going to be a mod now. Add moderator. There you go. Good. We have two moderators. Any method to force yourself to work harder. Love your work. If you love your work, you'll work hard. I was talking to my wife about this recently, and um, essentially, 
Um, if you don't love your work, you're not going to want to do it. I always loved working. I loved studying. I loved playing hard. And that's because it was fun, right? It's like what I want to do. That's another mindset issue that a lot of people have. They don't want to be doing their work. And I really, 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 really want to be doing my work. Victor, can I ask, can I check your question from earlier? This is not an ask me anything, but that'll be tonight on Reddit, 8 p.m. till 10 p.m. If you want to read, type it, feel free to type it in. Um, let's see. Okay, so anyway, um, do we take a break whenever things are going poorly? I don't really take a break, but that's because I don't really have, again, mindset issues, right? I don't, I'm not going on tilt. I'm not playing poorly. If you're going on tilt and playing poorly, then that may be an issue. A lot of people think that they are um, playing well, but they're just in a downswing. And also, Thomas, you have to ask, how long is a downswing? For a lot of people, a downswing is a week, a month, like almost no time at all. A lot of people are really quick to try to find a solution to a problem that doesn't exist. If you are a definitively proven winning poker player over multiple years or multiple hands, lots and lots and lots of samples, then like, you just shouldn't change anything when things are going poorly because quite often it's just variance, right? You're going to have downswings. And that's just part of the game. But if you actually are bad, well, you need to study a time. And I mean, I didn't play for any real money. Even then, I bought it for $50. Um, I didn't play for significant money until I had studied a lot. Like, I was just so much better than my opponents back then. Because I had study time. I mean, I knew from chess that studying a ton will just make you way better than everyone else. And I approach poker in the same way. So I did not play poker to play poker and to gamble. I played because I thought it was a fun game to play. And someone else asked me a question the other day. Something to the effect of, I just retired. I have uh, plenty of money. Should I start playing... Um, $100 tournaments online. I haven't really played a ton, but I want to take it more seriously. And my answer to that was absolutely no. You're going to get slaughtered. Because $100 tournaments online are tough. Why not start with $5 tournaments? That's what I basically said. And his reply was, but then I, I won't play seriously because I don't care about $5. And you have to understand that that mindset is the mindset of a perpetual loser. And maybe even a degenerate gambler. Because those players always need to feel the rush. They need to be excited. They play because it excites them. And if you're playing for excitement, that's not going to work out so well for you because you're the way you get excited and stay excited long term is to play bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. And uh, whenever we're talking about a guy's retirement account, I'm not going to sugarcoat this and say, oh yeah, sure, give it a try, see how it goes. I'm going to say, no, that is perhaps the dumbest thing you could do to play $100 buying tournaments online to get experience. And his logic was, well, I'll get more experience faster playing higher stakes. And you just won't. Do I have any articles on bounties? Yes, there's one on um, jonathanlillipoker.com. It's one of the oldest uh, articles on there. It's something about a Jacksonville $500 bounty, something or another. Go find it. <sighs> How do you have confidence to play for a living when everyone doubts your abilities? Twiggy, what other people think doesn't matter. Fortunately, poker is a pure math game. If you have consistent results, then you should go play for a living if that's what you want to do. I mean, how did my, how are my parents, who are very conservative people, who valued education, et cetera, et cetera, cool with me quitting my job and quitting college and giving up a scholarship? How were they um, okay with this? Well, and, and they're very quick to tell me they don't want me to do things. So how are they okay with this? And they were okay with this because I showed them Roughly two years of me playing 3,000 sit and goes a month, okay? And I show them every year, I'm going to have roughly two break-even months. I'm going to have two really big winning months, and I'm going to have the rest pretty good winning months. And these winning months were roughly $20,000 a month. So I was making 200 k a year, give or take, and consistently, right? It was about, about a year and a half, I had that 350 k like we were talking about. And I, I showed them data, right? If you just think you can be a poker player because you played a little bit, and maybe even you've played a lot of live poker over the last year and you're winning it 100 bucks an hour over the last year, that may not be enough data. So what I would suggest is I would suggest you ease into it. So I, what was I doing as a kid? I was smart enough to do it like this. I kept a giant bankroll, 1,000 buy-ins, right? 10,000 buy-ins, something like this, plenty of buy-ins. 
Um, then I also quit the things that mattered least. I was working two jobs, one at a comic book store, one at an airport. I quit the comic book job first. That was just like for fun. So I quit that for, I mean, I was getting paid, but it was a, not a ton of time. So I quit that first, played more poker. Next, I quit my regular $10 an hour job to make $200 or $400 an hour online, whatever it was. Okay, quit that. And then I quit the next most important thing, which was college, right? College was the last thing I quit because that's the thing that mattered the most. If you have a job, don't quit your job. Take all of your vacation and play seriously for two weeks and see how it goes. Don't, don't just be a fish and think, I think I'm good at poker. I'm going to go give it a try. Because that, that's, that's just not smart, right? You, don't, you can ease into these things. You don't have to just blast it in there and change your lives. All right. Louis says, the stream is so inspiring, it gets you pumped up for the day. I'm glad to hear that, Louis Philippe. Um, where can you find something to study for cash games? Are you referring to books? Jonathan Little on live, no limit cash games. It's a great guide on cash games. All right. Can't decide what to spend your bonus stars on. Send me an email and I'll tell you. Give me a short life story. It's hard to find a good, low-skilled job. Well, that's why, that's why poker is a good thing, right? I mean, I was a kid with no... I mean, I was going to college. I was doing fine at it, but I, I was a kid making no money. My prospects were get out of college, get a 50K a year job, and go from there. And um, I'm making 200K from poker. Why do I want to go do that, right? And that was even like a good job. A 50K a year job would be a good job. You're wondering if you can interview me again. I mean, send me an email. Time is limited, but maybe we can do something. All right. Um, what next? Oh, yeah. That idea, that idea that we need to gamble, we need to play bigger is very, very detrimental because you always chase bigger and bigger highs, right? People get excited. They get adrenaline rushes or some other drug rushes in their brains. Or uh, I don't even know the right words. I'm not a, not a scientist and I'm not a doctor. Um, they get rushes in their brains and, uh, you don't want to feel that when you're playing poker. When you get excited, you're going to start playing worse and worse and worse to the point that if you're like on monster tilt, you just play really, really poorly. Right. And you very often default to your actual skill level, what, like what your base level of knowledge. So if normally when you're thinking you play pretty well, but if you stop thinking you're playing pretty poorly, it means you don't actually know the things that you're doing. So like if I go on tilt, raging tilt. The game's not going to change a whole lot. If you look at a lot of the best players in the world, their games don't change a whole lot because they're all very, very good, right? And even, even if they were like, if they were drunk off their asses, they would still play pretty well, assuming you told them we're playing for real money and this matters. But um, I always approach every game I think I've ever played from the mindset of I am trying to win this game. I didn't approach it from let's goof off and have fun. That's, because I, I'm not necessarily, like, to me, fun is playing well and winning. But to a lot of play people, fun is goofing off and doing stupid stuff. Like, I never was excited. Like, some of my friends, they win a big tournament for 100K, and they want to go play 5 cent, 10 cent, and play every single pot or whatever, and just give away $100. Like, why? why? What's the purpose of this? Um, so I always approached it from the point of view of I'm trying to play my best all the time. It doesn't even compute to me to try to play poorly on purpose. And I think a lot of people approach games very differently. Um, I wrote a blog post about the three types of people who play games. Um, one type plays very socially. They don't really care about winning. The other type likes to push the boundaries. Very often, these players make it to the middle stakes. And they, they start winning you know, $500 tournaments and whatnot. But they never really play high stakes. Or if they do, they don't play very well or for very long. And that's because their goal is to try to run big bluffs and make big folds and do fancy things. And... You know, certainly there are times where you do need to be making big bluffs and big folds in poker, but if you're, like, actively looking for these spots, you're going to find spots that don't exist, that aren't there, and you're just going to end up playing poorly. If you play poorly, you're going to lose. So, like, I know a lot of, a lot of time in Vegas they have these, like, $1,000 series at random casinos, and they're just full of players like this. They're so fancy. They'll start with 500 big blinds, and half the field will be gone in an hour because they just don't know what they're doing, right? They're trying to push the boundaries, and... That's not what you need to do to win. The people who win care about specifically winning. And they're not there to get a rush. They're, the rush for them is to win the game, right? Like, I'm not excited and happy until I win the game. And 
I'm not playing the game to for happiness. I'm playing the game... It makes me happy to win, I guess, is what it is. I'm, I don't get happy when I win a big pot, because winning a pot in the tournament is not the end of the game. Um, let's see... It might be hard for me to play a tournament and record my thought. Oh, I've done that plenty of times, Lewis. I, I have a training site where I have plenty and plenty of videos of me, of me playing live. If you're a member of PokerCoaching.com, you have access to FloatTheTurn.com. I have plenty of videos of me playing live. All right. You think it's you think playing in tougher games is a good way to find out if you're going down the right path? No, not really. Um, I think that you don't need to play bigger. Like, to me, I was never trying to play as big as I could possibly play. And to be fair, that probably cost me money because I was definitely skilled enough to do it. I talked about this the other day on A Little Coffee where they opened up 25 50 no limit on party poker and I was playing sit and goes with Andrew Robel and Justin Bonomo and all those players and they very quickly moved to 25 50 just because it was a bigger game than the $2,000 sit and goes. And they were winning. And I was thinking, wow, all the best players just left. <laughs> now it's just me and all the other people so I'm just going to sit here and play sit and goes. And my ROI went up, right? Five of the best regs left, and my ROI went through the roof. And then I started realizing, you know, these guys are maybe making like five or 10K a day, and I'm making whatever it was, $1,000 a day. And would I rather make five or 10K a day or $1,000 a day? So I moved over there eventually, and then a month later, Party Poker closed to Americans, so that was a bummer. But I was making tons of money, just like they were, right? And... That's because I'm not looking to push it so hard. Like, to me, it's detrimental to go broke, right? For me, I, and for a lot of my friends, really, um, they've always been pretty nitty with their bankrolls, and it's cost them some money in terms of not not having the potential to have a huge gain. I mean, we see um, Dave Benefield and Tom Dwan, they were, they were willing to push it, and they ended up playing super-duper high stakes against the owner of a circus, and uh, they won a bunch of money from it, right? Some players, though, who were equally as good as them tried that too, and went broke, or lost a lot of their bankroll. And imagine 10 players played against the circus owner, and four of them lost, and six of them won. And do you want to be, you want to gamble that for half of your money? Because that's what they all did. They gambled for half their money on that, with the logic of I can always move back down, grind it back up. It might take me a year or two to grind it back up, but I could do it. I didn't want to take that risk. I was just happy to have my consistent money. Talk about adjusting to high rake. Um, play tighter. If the rake is high, play really, really, really tight. That's how you beat tight, uh, tight games. I'm sorry, high rake games. <sighs> okay, you play poker for money. Yes, I do. Do you ever gamble on games for fun to get a rush? No, I don't get a rush. If I play any game, I'm playing it because I think I have an edge. Sure, it's exciting to have lots of money on the table, but that should not affect your win rate. I mean, for example, I, I do play some blackjack. Why do I play some blackjack? Well, it's a math game, right? If they're going to give you comps to a state of place that costs like $500 a day, and you know your expected loss in the blackjack game is, let's say, $300, that's a value, right? Maybe you can even play a little bit better. Maybe you're almost break even at blackjack. Maybe you only lose $100 in the day and you get the $500 value. That's a good example of a spot where the casino values the hotel room at like 50 bucks a night, but they will charge you $100 for it, or $500 for it. So in their minds, I'm going to lose $100 or $200 to them in exchange for a $500 asset that's worth $500 to me, but only worth $50 to them. So they make $150 on the deal. So they're happy. And I um, I save $300 on the deal. Hi, come here. Come here. Come here. Hurry. James saying bye to everyone. Come here. Do you want to say hi? Let's say hi. Come here. Uh, oh, you're heavy. <laughs> Here's Mr. James. Can you say hello to everyone? Hello. Do you think you're good? Go. Yeah, you're very good. It's James. Yeah. How many daddies do you see? One. Count them. Two. I'm more days. You see three? Three daddies. Can you tell everyone, uh, say I love you to everyone? Bye. Bye. Can you blow a kiss? Mm. Oh, you're bye. so sweet. Bye, bye, bye. Did you have a good weekend? With okay. me? You so have a, do you have an airplane? Oh, so old. You show me an airplane? Okay. Zoom, zoom, zoom. Airplane. Okay. Bye. Have fun. Have fun. 
Love you. Yeah, go play with Grandpa. Ah, oh, it's Mr. James. I've been playing hometown tournaments in Pensacola. It's been very profitable. Good. I don't know what's happened to this program here, but everything's messing up. How do you approach very wild games? Play tightly. So you say you can't play tightly. Be a little bit active, especially in the small pots. Lewis, we're combining the two sites at the moment. So there's no good reason. Also, float the turn is included in poker coaching. All right, let's see. You feel like you're hurting your game by playing vastly different games as far as skill level. Um, Thomas, like let's say you play some games that are really tough, like online, and then you also play live. The games will be very different skill levels, but you need to know how to play against all different types of opponents and understand that players are different, right? It's not just as simple as I'm good at the live games because people are bad, or I'm good at the online games, whatever. You need to learn how to play against every specific opponent you encounter, and some of them will just be better than others, right? And whenever you go to play a tournament, let's say, you don't get to pick who you're playing against. Sometimes it's going to be tough, sometimes it's going to be soft. And your goal as a poker player is to learn how to play against everyone. So understand that you're not trying to play some default strategy blindly. You're trying to maximally exploit whatever your opponents are doing wrong. And if it's a lot, then you can adjust really hard. And if it's not a whole lot, well, then you just have to play close to G closer to GTO than they do. Um, but yeah, if you're trying to get into poker, the idea of I have to play big to care is so, so, so bad. And then some people say that, yeah, well, poker wouldn't be a game if you weren't playing for money. And um, I completely disagree with this because, well, first off, look at all the play money games, right? People play for play money. Um, but also... Look at a lot of other games. Look at chess. You don't play chess for money. I mean, you can. You can play any game for money, but you don't start playing chess for money. You start playing chess with your friends for fun. Look at Magic the Gathering. Very often you don't play for money. Look at uh, Checkers, Tic-Tac-Toe, Monopoly. Na name any game, right? People play games for fun. And poker is a game people play for fun. And you don't have to play... I mean, it just, like, the question reeked of, I have a gambling problem, I want to gamble for my retirement money. How do I do that? How do I justify that to myself? And um, I'm a relatively blunt poker coach with my, with my um, advice, and, like, this was just a bad idea. So anyway, uh, don't gamble for all your money, especially if it's your retirement money. And the issue is that guy was looking to start $100 games. Maybe he plays those, he loses some, next thing you know he's playing 1Ks online, and... Three years later, retirement money's gone. That's how that goes. And I don't think he even listened to my advice. But that's okay. Everyone's not going to listen. Some people have to learn the hard way. Can I do a tutorial on the range analyzer? Yes, if you go to the range analyzer, there's instructions right at the top of the page with a video of me explaining it. It's right at the top of the page. As a youngster, you get quite excited even though you're not playing for fun. You're playing to win money. Mmm, you don't necessarily know that. You already have live tells. Uh, you can't help but react slightly differently when you have a trash hand. Get over it. Play more. Biological conditioning is a real thing. When I used to play the trumpet, my band director purposely gave me very hard solos that I could not play. I don't know why. I think this was very beneficial because it taught me that you're going to lose a lot of the time. You're going to play poorly a lot of the time. It's good to not have a lot of successes. It's good to get beat down a little bit. And so anyway, I would fail at the solos, I don't know, 70 or 80% of the time when I was playing in the halftime show in front of all the school. And it was devastating the first few times. And then after a while, I realized, this doesn't really matter. Almost no one cares. I am the person who is best situated to do this job, according to the band director. And even if I fail at this, I'm doing a better job than my peers, right? Who would have done maybe not quite as good because presumably they play worse than me. So I'm going to go up there and do my best, and if I fail, that is okay. I will try my best, though. I think it's a lot of people who fail do so purposefully to some extent. Like, say you have a test. You know you have a test tomorrow. Instead of studying for the test, you go and you play video games all night. Well, yeah, now you're just a loser, right? You're someone who's not going to succeed in life. If instead you study very hard, it just turns out the test is really hard, or maybe it doesn't... It's just not something you're naturally good at, Right? then you're, you're, it's okay. You're not going to succeed. And you, you, don't, you have to stop equating success and failure with like worth as a human. I think a lot of people associate those things very, very closely. 
And in poker especially. <laughs> like, losing in poker is going to happen. Going, losing for a long time in poker is going to happen. And you got to get over the idea that I lost a tournament or I lost a cash game, therefore I am a failure. Because that's not how it works. Your first turn is a $600 buy-in game. To see how you do, I would tell you to play smaller tournaments before then. Were you in a relationship when I was learning poker? No. Actually, maybe I was. Um, no, not initially. When I was 18, no. Blondness is good for a knucklehead like you. <laughs> good. Let's see. Um, so going back, uh, someone, I think it was Lewis, someone mentioned, I play for money. Almost no one plays poker purely to make money. It takes a very special mindset. Um, it turns out a lot of those people who actually do make it to the top or they quit very quickly. So if you've been playing poker for a long time and you think you play poker to win money, but you're not winning money and you haven't quit, then uh, maybe that's not true. Um, quite often people will play to socialize and they don't necessarily realize it. Or they will play to try to push the boundaries, but they don't really realize it. That's the tough thing about poker is that it's very hard to analyze what is actually happening. And like I know I personally play purely to win. I have, I have a bunch of friends. I mean, if you look at a lot of the best players in the world, they also play purely to win. But if you look at a lot of the people who are not winning and they're still playing, or they're breaking even and they're still playing, they are not playing to win. They are playing for one of the other reasons. And you can play for both reasons, right? You can play to try to make money. But maybe you have a little issue with you always try to push the boundaries. The next thing you know, you ran another big bluff again. And, uh, you know, if you run, keep running the big bluffs and they keep failing and you don't, all, you don't change, well, then, then you're a fish. All right, let's see. You find that studying and then playing and losing most of the time. You know, taking a break and coming back, you apply the new knowledge and you do well. Well, good. Nothing prepares you for success like failure. <laughs> um, I don't know if that's necessarily true. So, Fred, in, in poker and in Magic the Gathering, games that are very situated for nerdy type people, some nerds do very well with success and some do very poorly. Like, if, if you look at People, people who play Magic the Gathering, some of these kids are like the most obnoxious humans you've ever seen. And it's because they have failed at everything in life besides exactly this one card game for children. And that leads to them not knowing how to handle success. I, I think you do need a, a little bit of doses of success throughout your life. You don't want to just not have a clue how to act, right? Like I remember as a kid, there was this one kid who was just such a jerk. Because he thought he was like, the, he associated his value as a human with the fact that he was good at a children's card game. And that's just ridiculous. If you're good at poker, it doesn't mean you're uh, an amazing human being or something. We're playing a card game, right? It's important to understand your role in life. And if you think that you're an amazing person that people should bow down to because you are good at cards, you need to look at life, right? It's important to understand. Also, if you're playing high stakes poker, and you're having good success, the people you're winning from very often think you're the fish at life. And you probably are, right? Because a lot of these people who can afford to lose multiple thousands of dollars a year, millions of dollars a year, whatever, they, they're crushing it. They're actually crushing it on a big scale. Whereas if you're making $20,000 a month only from poker, you're small potatoes at the end of the day. And again, maybe this is just me with the mindset of I'm always trying to aspire to be the best I can and, and comparing myself to people who are significantly better. But you have to understand, like, po poker player, poker pros are playing, like, their livelihood, right? And the recreational players are playing because they're just having fun and goofing off. Maybe they're trying to win. Again, they can still try to win and then be goofing off. But it's important to understand that, that you're not amazing. And I think maybe that's it, is it? I always understood I was just not amazing. And that led me to consistently work harder and harder and harder to try to be amazing. Um, maybe it's the, the fact that I always approach poker as a student of the game as opposed to just someone who was gambling or someone who thought that he was amazing. I mean, you see this a lot in poker. You'll see some people who rise to the top of like the heads-up games, and then eventually they fall off. Why do they fall off? Because someone better came along, someone who worked harder, someone who was hungrier. And there's always going to be someone who wants to work harder and is hungrier than you, even if you are working hard and are very hungry. 
Since you don't play poker for a living, do you count as a recreational player? Like Talal. Um, I mean, I think everyone thinks Talal is pretty good. I don't think anyone thinks Talal is the best players in the room, right? I mean, look, you can be recreational, but very serious. I mean, if you look at a lot of the very high stakes uh, recreational players, maybe you want to call Talal someone like that. Um, he's, he's, I'm very, very confident he works very hard and studies a ton. Um, but he doesn't have his whole life to devote to it like a lot of the kids do. So inevitably, he's going to be very, very good, but not the best. So, like, like, the classifications are irrelevant. Like, why does it matter if you're a pro or not a pro? It matters if you're good or if you're not good. If you are more skilled than your opponents or less skilled than your opponents. And, I mean, this happens a lot, right? I mean, it's, it's, Gus Hansen's famous for this, where he's been very, very good at poker, but he always played against better people. So if you're the 10th best poker player in the world, but you play against only better people, well, then you're a fish, right? Even though you're the 10th best player in the world. And if you're the millionth best player in the world, and you play with the 10 millionth best players in the world, you're going to crush them. So try to, try to not worry about classifying people like that. How do you analyze if you're successful? Hourly, weight, hourly rate, win rate, etc. Yes, figure out how much money you're making per hand, ideally. Per hand is kind of irrelevant, per hundred hands, per hour, whatever. Figure out that, and that will let you know if you're winning or losing. You need to be winning if you actually want to move up and better your life. All right. You're up $1 per game over the last 5,500 sit and goes with $5 buy in. So 20% ROI. Do you recommend you move up? Yes. So that means you have a 5,500 bankroll, presumably, because you definitely shouldn't be spending any of this money. If you have $5,500, you are bankrolled for. Um, $30 games, give or take? $40 games? So, yeah, move up. Play $10 games. See how it goes. It only matters if you're not a pro in the ta when it comes to taxes. Yeah, that's pretty much it. Um, you admire the time I spend with my kid. Well, thank you. I do my best. Did I ever play, even though I didn't feel like it, because I... Had to put in the hours to make money. I never had to make money. That's another big secret. I was a kid. I was living with my parents, right? I had like $1,000 in expenses a month, which I was making working my job. I made, I don't know, $1,600 a month. I was spending 1000 of it on a car and insurance and food and Magic the Gathering cards. And so I had 600 bucks a month left over. Let's just pretend. Maybe that's the number. Maybe it's more. I don't know. Um, so I didn't need money. And I never spent money. I, I did not make a cash out from party poker until I had like 300K in my account, which is obviously stupid uh, looking back. But I, I never played for money. Like I never spent money. I, I'm a kid. I don't need to buy things. And I mean, I think the first time I cashed out money was to buy a condominium, <laughs> right? I bought a house. That was my first cash out. And that's because I, I was never playing for the money. That's what I'm trying to tell all of you all. I was not playing for money. I was playing because I enjoyed it. Um, and a lot of people approach poker from the idea of, I need to make some money to pay for blank. And if that's how you approach the game, you're doing it very, very wrong. Almost all projects that you are passionate about and you want to do, you should be happy to do them for free or next to free. And I mean, that's how I got into poker, right? I was playing for essentially pennies when I started, $50 buy-in. And I never cashed out because I didn't need to cash out. I, I, ha I realize keeping expenses low will make you move up faster. My goal is to move up fast and learn how to make good money. And when I say move up fast, I mean fast in a very disciplined manner, keeping 200 buy-ins of sit and goes or more before I would move up. And that's important. I mean, I remember watching these, uh, they had $15,000 buy-ins sit and goes running on party poker for a while. I think only four or five of them ran. And I remember not playing them. And at that time, I think I had like 300K to my name. So if I have 300K, why am I not willing to gamble here in this sit and go that was soft? I, I knew like two of the players in it were not good. Well, it's because I only have 20 buy-ins, right? It's nowhere near 200, so I didn't play. I'm sure it probably made financial sense to gamble at it and play it, but that's how I thought. I was highly prioritizing not going broke because to me, going broke would be detrimental. And for most good pros, going broke is detrimental, so you don't want to do that. Uh, can't see results if you're not playing enough. Yeah, you need to play more. Volume is important. When you have to do something, you start to dread it. I think that is true. 
How old was I when I made my first withdrawal? I think it was 19. How long I've been playing? Two years. Year and a half. Maybe I was 20. I was 19 or 20, something like that. Is $15 a good hourly rate at 1-3? Well, it's obviously winning. What does good mean? Who are you comparing yourself to? 1-2 game. 420 effective. You get ace-king diamonds in the cutoff. Middle position raises 17. Makes a humongous raise. Folds to you. You make it 40, 70 calls. Comes jack-8-3 rainbow. You don't even say what happened on the flop. I guess it goes check-check, um, which is probably okay. Turns a king. You bet 50. Sure. About magic. You know you played against a few people, and you learned so much. Yes. It's very important to learn from people who are better than you. Get good first, then money will follow. Hi. Turns king of clubs, middle position player, best. If there if there's two king, I, I I don't know what you're saying, Zach. If there's two kings on the board, you should probably jam over. Hi, James. Go go play with Grandpa. What are the steps to improving in a systematic way? Go to PokerCoaching.com. Okay, I'm going to give you a great way to improve very quickly. Go to PokerCoaching.com. Sign up for a free one-week trial. Completely free. Go to the oldest homework challenge. Scroll all the way to the bottom. Start with the oldest. Do the homework question on your own. Answer it. It's going to take you an hour or two. Do that. Then watch my answer. Okay? See where we differ. Then go through the student's answers. Find someone's answer who looks kind of like yours. Go watch what I say about that student's answer. Then do that again and again and again. We have like 30 or 40 homework challenges there. And 30 or 40 hours time, 30, 40, 30 or 40 times two hours, that's going to take you about 80 hours of work to get through those. That's not even counting the 400 something quizzes we have there, which will also help reinforce this. Do that. With all the homework challenges, you will be very good at poker. It's only going to take you 80 hours. Think of the value, right? When you grind online, you play 10 tables at once. Probably too many. Some people play more or less. Yes, you're considering playing less, but a higher buy-in. You probably should. You can't afford big downswings. Ship it, don't die. Or ship, don't die. You're, it sounds to me like if you are playing that many tables, but you don't have much of a bankroll, it means you haven't grinded very much. If you're actually good, you will accumulate money quickly if you're playing in a game that you can beat. If you can't beat the game, stay the same game, but play fewer tables and pay more attention. Keep your average buy-in low. Understand, again, it sounds like maybe you're in a situation where you need money. If you need money, that's not where you want to be. You need to stop needing money. There's lots of ways to cut your expenses, by the way. You can move to a cheaper place. You can room with someone. You can um, not have a car, right? Figure out ways to get rid of consistent expenses that are reasonable, and uh, that will be very, very beneficial to you. Do you feel like higher stakes and limit games are drying up? Yes. That happens to all games. All games get tougher and die. I mean, you look at chess, right? Chess is very, very tough, and it died. Look at bad game. It got very tough, and it died. Look at No Limit Hold'em. It got very tough, and it died. No Limit Hold'em. The, the high stakes No Limit Hold'em. Super high stakes. Which is why the tournaments are kind of still booming, because it's way more difficult to know who's good or bad in a tournament than it is in uh, cash games, because cash game players typically win or lose relatively consistently. Whereas uh, tournament players can go on big upswings or big downswings. Very often the players who are losing players in the um, super high stakes tournaments or even high stakes tournaments are up money. Think about that one. The bad players are up money in tournaments. If you're up money, why would you stop playing, right? Do you ever play poker in New York? No. You're a consistent winner, but yeah, regular bills. Well, you need to play more then. Put in more hours. Put in many more hours. Oh, I see. So on the turn, you get a king of clubs. You bet 50, a guy raises to 150, raises the minimum. I would probably call, call and then call river. If it's not a not a club, or probably just not a club. Queen would be pretty bad, too. Um, okay. What was I just saying? Oh, yeah. So think about this, right? The losing players in tournaments often win. They win money. They think they're good now. They play some more. Maybe they even win again, right? Now they're up like 400 buy-ins or 200 buy-ins or something like this. And they ha can now lose for a long time before they happen to realize, oh, maybe I just suck. 
Um, tournaments are great too because when you win, it's like, wow, I really, I did it. I won 100 buy-ins. I did 200 buy-ins, right? You're thrilled. In cash games though, the losing players basically lose all the time. They lose 40-ish or 50 or 60% of their sessions, or maybe they actually are a small winner, but then whenever they go off, they go off for a lot, which is what a lot of people do. People who try to lock up a win every session are often some of the biggest losers because they have substantial losses when they do lose. Um, but anyway, going back to tournaments, in the super high stakes games, almost all the, the obviously losing players are up a lot of money. It's because they're running hot. And if uh, those players run hot, they keep running hot. It doesn't mean they're winning players, it just means they're running hot. And tournaments are great for that, which is why tournaments thrive and high stakes cash games are much more difficult to keep around because in cash games you need a consistent influx of people who are just bad and don't mind losing money. And a lot of people who, a lot of people mind losing money, it turns out. A lot of people don't like losing consistently. Could you imagine having something in your life where every month you lost 25% of your income? This happens for a lot of people, by the way. I've seen them in Nevada. They, they go and they, they obviously just work some sort of um, difficult job, you know, construction job or something. They go into a gas station and they play the slot machine and they put in probably half the money or all the money they got. And that is sad and depressing. You do not want to be that person. And I try to make sure you don't end up like that. Don't be a degenerate gambler. That would be terrible. All right, I'm going to go now. Hope you enjoyed today. When did I realize I was good at poker? I don't think I've realized that yet. <laughs> Maybe one day. Um, so, I'll be doing an Asking Anything on Reddit tonight from 8 p.m. until 10 p.m. Go to Reddit. What's the URL? Let's see. Go to reddit.com slash r slash poker. And it should be kind of near the top. Feel free to type in a question. I will answer it if I can. I'm going to post this video for the person who asked me that initial question. And uh, thank you for sending in all the questions. I appreciate it. Voltaire says, appreciation is a wonderful thing. It makes what is excellent in others belong to us as well. Cool. Not usually awake, but you love catching the show. Wake up and wake up early. Wake up, have your little coffee. And get to it. All right, have a great day. Enjoy yourselves. Good luck with your Monday.